on this episode of Edge of the Web. Less than 1% of the leads that marketers and sales are generating are turning to customers. But in the way, 99% of what marketing and sales works on doesn't drive revenue. So that really baffled me. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. All right. Hey, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios located in downtown Indianapolis. Welcome back to Edge of the Web. For all of our uh, listeners on uh, the audio side of things uh, in iTunes and Google Play and all the different podcast platforms, welcome. Thanks for joining us regularly uh, at our uh, our drop time of audio, but on, on the uh, Facebook side of things, thanks for joining us. Uh, and we certainly uh, welcome uh, all of our listeners to jump into the live stream on a regular basis here, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern every Thursday. Uh, every every week we actually cover the latest marketing, digital marketing trends, and talking to marketing influencers from around the planet. It's really exciting to be able to do that regularly here on Edge of the Web. You can check out all the shows that we've had. We've had seven years of shows uh, over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. The uh, the show is actually produced, at, well, it's, it's sponsored by the title sponsor, Site Strategics, our own company. Uh, and we are a digital marketing, agile digital marketing agency focused on developing results that, that mean uh, an increase in your bottom line. So if you're interested in what we do over at Site Strategics, just go over to site strategics.com. Uh, give us a shout. Uh, you know, let us know what we can do to kind of unpack some possible uh, actions and, and uh, tactics that could bring your digital marketing success. So uh, if you if you would go, over, go on over there and check that out. Uh, I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. I'm the CEO of Site Strategics and uh, founder of uh, Edge Media Studios here. The reason wh why we do this show, um, well, actually, let me, let me introduce somebody else here uh, alongside me. This is Tom Broadbeck. He is the director of digital media here at Site Strategics. Hello, hello. Uh, Tom, we haven't done this in a while, but I'm going to ask you, why do we do what we do? Oh, we do it to continue our education of our of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when you would ask me this question back in time, I said we do it for money. <laughs> That's right. We did that a long time ago. Uh, and and it, the fact of the matter is, it's 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 a discipline that we love to do. But uh, we love it because it gives us such an education in the digital marketing space. I mean, I don't know where else you could you could get this regularly and be able to talk to yeah. some great influencers, some great marketers from around the planet. So it's a little bit self-indulgent, uh, keeping our, our, our sword sharp and our powder clean. But uh, it's also very important that we demystify and debunk a lot of stuff that's out there and just kind of open up some tactics and, and discuss it because there's so many things in the digital marketing space. Um, you can get run over by how many things are out there. You don't have time to focus on, uh, you know, different areas like conversion rate optimization, video optimization, social media marketing. Uh, there's so many different nuances in there that we try to bring some talent and bring some education to the mix and, and uh, really help our audience, right? Absolutely. And we have a great guest with us today. We do have a great guest. So introduce our guest, Tom. Sangram Vajre. You just wanted me to say the name. So you <laughs> I did. I did. All right. Sangram, are you there? I am here. How you doing? I'm good. And he has some, we were talking before the show, he has some Indianapolis connections too. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm in. Uh, well, so I used to run marketing at Pardot uh, back in the days. So I went through the acquisition of Exact Target. So we're really close to with Tim Cobb and Scott Dorsey. Oh, and cool. Now, uh, in Terminus, uh, which I co-founded uh, a couple of years later. Uh, so it's, it's been a really good, I love it. It's an hour flight from Atlanta, which I feel is a good thing. Yeah, I mean everything comes out of Atlanta on the East Coast. I mean you can't you cannot go anywhere <laughs> into, and, and not and not stop in in Atlanta, right? That is true, and it is super busy yeah, like every time. But I recently got my TSA pre-check, which has been a amazing thing. To just <laughs> walk in and just oh yeah. yeah, for our for our audience for our audience that doesn't know what that is, tell us what the TSA pre-check is. <laughs> well, it, it you know you don't have to take your shoes off, you don't have to take your laptop off, you can just fly through the airport with really literally five minutes. You stop uh, from Uber, five minutes, you are actually at your gate. Uh, so it, it is really a time saver. And 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 I got to ask, 
How much is that? <laughs> how, how do we get that? <laughs> no, it's, it's not expensive. I was surprised. It's like 85 bucks for like five years. No. I, I mean, I travel every other week. So uh, to me, it is a worth every penny. Absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, uh, out, <laughs> for everybody who actually is doing some traveling, you know, got to do it, man. Uh, all right. So uh, we want to get into customer experience with you, uh, uh, Sangram, but, but first and foremost, we wanted to get your insight on some of the digital marketing news that's out there. Are you ready to go for it? Let's do it. All right. So let's take you through the latest digital marketing news. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. All right, so uh, first on the dock, it's from Matt Southern. I, I, I want to go back through our shows and see how many shows we did not reference Matt Southern. <laughs> he has been an incredible producer yeah. of content over the years, and we certainly want to give a uh, tip of the hat to him. He's always bringing some great information. Over at Search Engine Journal, Google introduces new ways for to YouTube advertisers to make some money. So uh, what we've got here are ad extensions. So Google has actually introduced some new capabilities for YouTube ads that will help advertisers drive more conversions. Uh, the new feature actually combines the creative so uh, solutions offered by YouTube with the machine learning and measurement solutions offered by Google Ads. And you know they converged and brought Google uh, YouTube ads and advertising into Google about two and a half, three years ago. And now we're seeing the outcropping of that. We're seeing a heck of a lot more uh, uh, useful functionality these that have proven themselves in the Google ad space and uh, this is this is certainly uh, part of the course here so ad extensions uh, there's a number of examples on the screen right there where we can actually expand shows how a movie studio is using one of the new extensions to drive ticket sales so they break out each and every one of the times they've got new measurement solutions uh, they can actually uh, provide uh, actually uh, cost per lifted stu uh, users the advertisers can actually use a metric to optimize their campaign effectiveness and cost efficiency and lastly uh, Google's ramping up investments in the measurement partners to ensure advertisers can measure YouTube media with measurement studios or solutions I'm sorry that meet a stricter set of standards what are those stricter set of standards I wonder I don't know <laughs> we, we got to want to test it out <laughs> I do I do <laughs> We wouldn't mind being. Well, we already are a Google partner, but let's see. Uh, let's see if we can extend it a little bit. Anyway, uh, Google uh, uh, advertising and YouTube really did need this additional outcropping of new tools, and and we certainly see the value inside of Google Ads. And and in fact, extensions like this, Tom, mm -hmm. get a higher click through rate than your actual ad title on a regular basis. Sure. So this is where. People that are already trained and savvy to those type, those levels of functionality in the ads are uh, they're they're going to click on those things. They're going to interact with those ads to a much greater degree. What do you think, sir? And it's a really interesting thing. I think YouTube is obviously a place where, I mean, from an SEO perspective, it is a tremendous. Like we ourselves as a company, we try to do as much recording as possible of our own podcast, our own internal conversations and try to put it on YouTube and typically they will have a higher search engine ranking. Now from an AdWord perspective and advertising cost perspective, you really have never spent money on it. So mm -hmm. I'm curious and I'm going to start looking into it. You know, I, I could also posit the thought that with the optimization and what you can do inside of the content and getting the inbound, uh, inbound links coming back over to your domain and, and different landing pages, you're, you're going to train people on looking for the extensions on these different ads. You're going to have that combined additional effect of increased CTR on those inbound links as well because they're, sure. they're starting to move, you know, they're, they're unpacking that, that, uh, that video content a little bit more. Yeah, no, I just wanted to plug, uh, we had a sh great show with Corey Henke probably two, three months ago maybe now. Yeah. And uh, we really do dove deep into YouTube ads. So if anybody wanted to learn more about the YouTube ads, go, go, I said YouTube abs. <laughs> YouTube ads. At least it's not the hot yoga. <laughs> yeah. So YouTube ads, go go check that episode out. Do not search for YouTube abs. That's probably going to take you down a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. Uh, from TechCrunch, uh, the author is uh, Sarah Perez. Facebook follows Twitch and YouTube with launch of premieres, the live polls, and fan badges. Tom, take it away. What's this all about? Uh, so Facebook announced a new feature that they're calling Premieres. Uh, it's a new interactive video format that allows creators to pre-record a video for their fans and then release it during a viewing window that they choose to uh, choose to schedule it. 
Uh, so YouTube already had something similar, uh, as did uh, Twitch. So Facebook's uh, kind of late to the game on it. But uh, as more people are inter- using the Facebook Live, uh, this, this functionality definitely makes more sense. Um, it says, in addition, Facebook's rolling out interactive video polls to more pages and making its top fans feature available to all Facebook pages worldwide. Um, yeah, so uh, we've we've kind of gotten around it a little bit with our we, – we've – not this show, but some other shows that we we've done uh, mm-hmm. for um, for ourselves in the past. Uh, like when we had a glitch or something, we we would rerun the show, right? And and so that I mean, it, it seemed like on Facebook's end that it was it was a live show, even though it wasn't. But uh, this definitely makes sense. So if you want to really wanted to hype something up, um, you can do uh, we can record it during the day, and if you wanted it at seven or eight o'clock at night, type of thing, you right. know, you you can uh, really hype up. Hype it up and get it out of office hours and and really put some marketing behind it. So, so we're what we're planning to do is uh, all day every day edge of the web shows each on the hour, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sagram, what do you think about this? Uh, how, uh, the Facebook play with this uh, the live video, but also the badges and the additional interaction there. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Which again is a really hard thing for me to, to really dive as I was looking at this uh, this story before because I'm big on LinkedIn uh, over Facebook uh, just from a B two B perspective and yeah. where a lot of the conversation is happening. So I think LinkedIn videos and LinkedIn content and the engagement that I typically get on LinkedIn is sometimes like ten times more than Facebook. And oh wow! Uh, so to, to me, I've kind of shifted a lot of what I do from a video marketing individually from a brand and all that stuff to really LinkedIn and it has been great. So you've taken a dive there. Um, what are your thoughts about LinkedIn? I'm just going going there. What do you think about the uh, the thoughts about LinkedIn live broadcasting? We don't have that yet, right? Yeah. I mean, I think if it does happen, like I feel like all in because again, if you're in B2B, it makes perfect sense. On Facebook, I'm connected to my mom. I'm connected to my sister. I'm connected, like, they don't need to see what I, and it kind of creates a very different dynamic for it. Yep. So when I talk about pure business stuff, it really has driven a lot of really interesting engagement and conversations LinkedIn. So I think it would make perfect sense to do it. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's always bothered me, the B2B side inside of Facebook, because you're, yeah. you know, quote, ghost, Ghostbusters, you're crossing the streams, man. You don't want to cross the streams. Uh, you, you want your family and, and your, your your engagement there, you know, and whatever uh, news feeds you're tripping through. But uh, when it comes down to that business relationship, it really didn't fit in that space, right? Or I think for me, it has been the, the crazy thing. one time I'm in looking at what's happening with uh, my friends over there, they're actually doing party and they're going to Bahamas uh, on a bachelor bachelor party. And then other side, like to be into another business conversation. It's just super weird to have it. <laughs> in the place. So I've started to part off like, okay, I, I can't handle both of these things at the same place. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a mullet, you know, uh, you know, oh, business up front and party in the back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so LinkedIn is the, 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 the front and Facebook's the mullet. Facebook, Facebook has been the mullet, and and uh, LinkedIn is 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 the, the the dapper dude that's doing business. Got it. No offense to the ladies out there. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Um, so, one more uh, TechCrunch article uh, over from. Uh, uh, well, check this out. Google Assistant. We've been talking about voice uh, voice assistant for a while from Frederick Frederick. Lardoni, Lardinois, Lardinois, Lard- Lardinois. Sorry, it's French. Me. Oh my gosh, Lardinois, Lardinois. Oh, hey. oh gosh. don't read the article with a French accent. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> Google Assistant gets more visual. Sorry, Frederick. Um, probably Friedrich too. You know, Ooh, maybe could be. Google today is launching a major visual de- redesign of its assistant's experience on phones. While the original vision of the assistant focused mo- mostly on voice, half of all interactions with the assistant actually include touch. So with this redesign, Google acknowledges that and brings more and larger visuals to the assistant experience. I tell you what, that's, this is fantastic because the, the, the dashboard and the UI on the assistant really needed an upgrade. It was it was getting kind of cluttered there, especially if you have multiple devices. 
um, it, it was, it's, it's a bit of a mess there. So if you're used to, uh, if you've used one of the recent crop of the assistant-enabled smart displays, then some of what's, what's new here may actually look familiar. So uh, as we screen through on, on our live cast here, check out some of the, uh, the, the interactions there. The, Google actually tells the author that the update will roll out over the course of the next few weeks with the iOS release depending on Apple's App Store review process. And that's always a, a, a toss-up there. Some of the uh, functionality here, well, I mean, you're an Android user. Yeah. You use Google Assistant all the yeah. time, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, my, my daughter uses it all the time to, to hear what a cat says. So it'll, so it'll <laughs> meow. But uh, also here a little bit further down in the article, it says uh, Google also announced a few new features for developers. Uh, they're calling Rich Responses. It provides developers with a, preset, with a set of pre-made visual components that they can easily use to extend their Assistant actions. Um, so oh. some of the ones that they're showing here, um, it's like Starbucks, you can uh, sync in your uh, your Google account. Uh, so they're calling it Google Sign In that you can create your account and you can tie it into your like your Starbucks. And so yeah. it'll make an easier purchase through your Starbucks. But a lot of these, um, the article kind of explains that it's for the, um, oh, what are they calling it? The, the visual displays, kind of like the Amazon Echo um, video oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. video call. I forget what it, that one's even called too. But they're, yeah. they're, there's more video screen type assistant devices that are that are coming out, and they'll probably be the hotter items for yeah. for Christmas technology this year. Uh, and so it. so th these are more geared towards that. So you can have it set up on your in your kitchen for your recipes, and you can scroll through, or you can use it to adjust your thermostat and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, Google hasn't rolled out one of those one of those type of video displays. Not not a Google <clears throat> branded one. I think there's a couple I've seen that are that are at least using the Assistant uh, API or the SDK. Gotcha. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Sangram, what do you think uh, about the this new user experience on the Assistant side of things? You know, uh, last week Dreamforce, uh, if uh, if people have been following that, Salesforce announced that they're going to do a audio like you know, literally you can just talk to your phone and set up deals and, and all, like all audio assisted activities. And I feel like that just that is just the new life or the world that we live in. So I, I love it. I feel like that's the kind of uh, way we should be thinking about everything. Uh, the easier, the faster, the better. The only caveat to all of this is that the security of a lot of these things really gets into, you know, start compromising. So for example, you know, I have an Amazon Echo and it doesn't have a password, right? And uh, so I can order and so can my kids and uh, they can ask and everything, they can look at everything, they can ask any question. There's no no protocol, there's no way to kind of slice and dice, there's no security. So I think that's really becomes the biggest question of the day for me. Yep. Uh, but from a functionality and usability perspective, man, it's easy, super easy, so why not? Yeah, you know, uh, that, uh, I wouldn't mind uh, opening it up a little bit because all oh, the pervasiveness of these devices, okay? Um, you're starting to see them in different rooms of the house. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. The kids can go yeah. no halls barred. Well, I've started to get on the other side of the management of the Echo, and they have certainly have, have dug in and started to create new functionality to kind of restrict the, uh, the, the different devices. It's almost like you have... You know, in the old days, the set-top boxes, uh, you can control different deliveries uh, in different areas of the house where you're going to get into the space where you've got to lock down some of the devices. Um, yeah. And on top of that, my kid uses his Echo, right, his little mm -hmm. Echo Dot. The seven-year-old, he keeps on saying, Alexa, go to volume 11. <laughs> there's, a, there's not a volume 11, but, they, I mean, literally, the kid's punching up the audio, so... I got, the, I got the app, so each and every time he does that, I just go down to volume five again. So it's a battle in the Sparks house. Guess who wins? Uh, you do. Because I've got a circle, and <laughs> yeah. I can actually Cut shut down the device yeah. and no in, <laughs> any internet access going to it. There's no, uh, was it the movie Spinal Tap? There's not Spinal Tap. This is Spinal Tap. And, yeah, this is Spinal There's no joke that Amazon created for turning it up to 11? No, no, no? absolutely not. But uh, that's a developer's... Very good reference, though. There's, there's a developer's... Uh, <laughs> Now, it it yeah. also happens in my house where I got two kids, uh, eight year old boy and a four year old daughter, and man, like it's a, it, it, you know. And the funny thing is, uh, Alexa is able to recognize my four year old daughter talking to her about playing "Let It Go" and and all kinds of stuff, right? So it is crazy. And what I heard is that it records everything that's happening in that's your right. house. So it's not just when you say Alexa; it's actually recording everything so it's kind of scary from a security perspective but yeah. i think we've all given up 
privacy and security for all from that perspective. Kind of like the Borg. Resistance is futile. We're going to be absorbed. But you're, you're absolutely right. They just think about the metadata that's coming from these devices. They're listening 24 hours a day. And the storage on that is just ungodly. It's creepy, man. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you what's not creepy. It's our newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter each and every uh, week. Uh, we'll send over some great information about uh, the guests that we just interviewed, as, as well as who's, who's going to be upcoming on the show, some news articles, and much, much more. So go over. If you want to text to the number, don't do it while you're driving, to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk right there on the screen. And you can sign up right there on your smartphone. You can go over to edgeofthewebradio.com as well and sign up right there at the, the header of the, uh, of, of the site, and you'll not your email will not be used for anything else except uh, sending you di digital nuggets of gold. How about that? Like gold, like gold, like digital gold too, and it's not Bitcoin. So uh, anyway, sign up there and uh, give us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing on the newsletter and uh, see uh, what else we can do for you. Uh, so follow all the featured trending uh, items over at edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, first and foremost, let's deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Sangram Vazre, co-founder and chief evangelist of Terminus. So the deep voice guy, hey, it's always great to be able to have him uh, introduce our guests. Uh, Sangram is the co-founder and CMO of Terminus, and we just talked about Terminus last show, so... It's so apropos that you're here. And, uh, Terminus has actually quickly built a, he, he's actually built a reputation as one of the leading minds in the B2B marketing. That, you know, that's why he's deep diving into uh, LinkedIn. Before co-founding Terminus, Sangram actually led the marketing team at Pardot. Uh, oh, Pardot. Uh, the, oh, I love that French. Hey. <laughs> I always called that when it, before Salesforce. Pardot. That's what it was. Uh, though, it's acqu through the acquisition by Exact Target and then Salesforce. So that, that dates you back a few years, huh? Yes. That was a really good, that was an excellent, excellent technology. It truly was. And that was kind of the fore, the forerunner for all of this reverse IP lookup, the 411 business 411 lookup uh, right. data. Um, anyway, Sagram is also the author of Account Based Marketing for Dummies and is the master, mastermind behind hashtag Flip My Funnel. All right, Sagram, that's the official bio, and there's a lot to unpack just in that. What in the world is Flip My Funnel? Let's go. All right. So uh, Flip My Funnel is an idea that, uh, that I came up with, what, maybe three years ago. So that even dates me. But I was on a flight from San Francisco to Atlanta after the Martech conference that Scott Brinker uh, did in San Francisco. And I was sitting in the middle seat next to two incredibly drunk people. And <laughs> the Wi-Fi wasn't working. The TV wasn't working. And I have nothing better to do. So I just tried to put my headsets on, even though they were not working, and uh, put an, uh, add a napkin and a, uh, and a pen. So I started to draw the traditional funnel that we all know, right? Which is uh, broad at the top and narrow at the bottom, which means you can put as many leads as possible from the top and then get as few leads as uh, customers as possible. So the stat that Forrester came out in 2015, just around that time, was less than 1% of the leads that marketers and sales are generating are turning to customers. But in the way, 99% of what marketing and sales works on doesn't drive revenue. So that really baffled me. So I just literally, again, 10,000 feet above the ground, what do we do? So I just flipped that napkin and came up with a flip funnel and started to come up with different stages that we can dive deeper in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that became the flip my funnel idea. So by the time I landed, I had written a blog that I published um, and, and it kind of went viral on LinkedIn, which means like five people liked it. So that led to <laughs> a, uh, a event and we've done like nine flip my funnel conferences, ended up writing a book on account based marketing as a result of it, we all, which we all now know is the category. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a fun journey for the last two, three years on that. Oh, that uh, we we want to get into that because this is the the it's not only out of the box. This is this is where digital marketing has taken us uh, to be able to understand that it's not broad based marketing. It's granular one to one marketing, and then being able to expand and be able to touch them in all different spaces. We're going to be able to jump in right into this. But if you would indulge me, we got to give some credence to our title sponsor real quick. 
All right, so Site Strategics is actually proud to be a sponsor of Edge of the Web, and we are always wanting to, to be able to provide some value back to our, our customers. So we want to make our, our, our listeners, I should say. Well, that was Freudian, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, so if you're interested in uh, what your digital marketing ROI is, we actually have a, com a comprehensive digital marketing report that uh, you can actually jump in and, and, and we, can, we can start looking at your assets and be able to see how different things are converting, what's the value of from an equity standpoint, and uh, looking at some gaps that you could possibly uh, beef up. It's almost like a SWOT report for your digital assets. So if you're interested in what uh, this report could uh, show you or your marketing firm that's working for you right now, uh, just jump into uh, the, the URL, edgeofthewebradio.com forward slash ROI, and uh, just communicate to us. There's no obligation. Just sign up right there, and we'll get the conversation going to see whether or not this report could help you out. Uh, there's no obligation whatsoever, but we certainly want to be able to give a, a discount uh, if if you're interested, and if we find that this is a solid engagement that you want to pursue, we got a 30% off discount on the report itself. So go over to edgeofthewebradio.com forward slash ROI, and uh, let's get the conversation started. All right. Sorry, Sangram, I gotta, gotta pay the bills. Uh, so, let's jump into, into this Flip My Funnel process so you came up with the idea on the airplane right between two drunk guys and they did they have any influence on that flip my funnel <laughs> no i guess uh, it looks like a martini glass right now <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say did they get the, the inebriated from the funnels there we go see <laughs> were they where where were they wearing the funnel as a cap i mean what kind of lap shape party did we have on that plane um so the funnel itself, we understand the tr traditional concept, and and it's always been a bit of a, a, a messy business, just trying to broad base out to customer, to potential customers, but but people that you don't even know, know, and try to hit them with so many different branding tactics, and hopefully they start finding and circling around your 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 digital brand and the different spaces you are, and hopefully you can get down into a particular conversion rate based on all those efforts, and on top of that, those efforts are so far removed from from any potential potential linear ROI so it's more adjusting I mean brand itself has always been this ubiquitous nebula, nebulous um, area and that you have to keep on throwing money in and hopefully customers find their way to you right right and it I equate to our marketing to uh, for or most part is like standing on a freeway uh, with a sign like, hey, I got, uh, you know, car wash um, happening, right? And you're on a freeway where people can't really take an exit, but you're still standing up with a, with a sign that says, hey, you know, get a free car wash, as opposed to taking that sign next to a, uh, a, a community where maybe most people are driving Ferraris and now go and do that. You're going to get more tips and more people are going to stop by and more value for your time than actually standing on a freeway. And I think that's what marketing needs to, to really start thinking. Are we doing the things just because it's check the box things like three blogs a week, one white paper a month, you know, five webinars a quarter, all those things, or should we be thinking about marketing and sales as a, as a practice? Like we need to know exactly who we want to go after and really focus our time, energy, money, resources on that. And that's really what the customer experience funnel that now we affectionately call, I guess, account is marketing yep. is all about. Well, so you you that's that's fantastic, and, and it really does make sense because instead of picking trying to throw it through to the masses and cost cast a big net, right? Yeah. You, you you do the diligence up front to be able to find who is going to be the best opportunity for success and the highest converter, based on a structure, a discipline of of understanding your true target audience. Who knew? So uh, give give us this. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think as you put it out there, right, it's just better marketing, right? Better sales process. Uh, I only think that B2B, if, if anybody who's listening is in B2B, uh, we should know what our total addressable market looks like, our TAM looks like. And I guarantee you that if you ask 10 people or 10 companies or 10 marketers working in 10 companies, eight of them will have no idea what their total addressable market looks like. And that's the gap. Mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is. Um, so take us through the steps real quick. You got four steps to be able to isolate this uh, inverted funnel model, right? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the first step is identify. That means you need to identify, goes back to your total addressable market, 
who are you targeting? Which companies, which accounts you're targeting? Uh, it's, it's not everybody in the world. It's You have to know if you're going after the financial services vertical and what Fortune 500, whatever that means. Just have a list of companies that you think are the best fit for the product or service you're trying to sell. So identify the companies. Mm -hmm. The second is, which is what we absolutely missed in the whole marketing automation world, and I'll take some of the blame for it, uh, having run marketing at Pardot and promoting Pardot and marketing automation is, in B2B, there are five, seven, if not 10 people part of the decision-making process. So just focusing on a lead that fills up a form and harassing them to, to have a conversation <laughs> is really, really is the right way to look. We need to expand and, and make sure that your message is in front of all the decision makers in that company. So expanding, figuring out who are all the influencers and decision makers in that company is really important. And once you identify the right company and the right people in the company that you need to go after, now you figure out what your engagement tactics are. In the original, like the traditional funnel, you start engaging before you find out. So you filter through until you get to the point of the person you want to talk to. Right. In this case, in a flip funnel approach, you identify the companies, you identify the people, and then you start figuring out what type of engagement metrics and engagement ideas that make sense. It might make sense for you to do direct mail because you're talking to doctors or nurses, or it might make sense for you to do high-tech one-on-one advertising because you are reaching out to to IT people. So depending on who they are, your engagement should now uh, focus on who you're targeting. And then the final step is advocacy. At the end of the day, if you're focusing the right people, which means it's going to be less, not everybody in the world, if you know who they are, you can't force people to buy, but you're going to create messaging so that they will feel that you care about them, you know enough about them, and hmm. they will be advocates anywhere they go. You know, as I look at your steps, I keep on hearkening back to um, the discipline of user profile, or uh, uh, user profiling, basically yeah. profile uh, that, that persona that you're trying to attract, and it does come from you're you're going from general to very specific. You're understanding the titles, the individuals that are decision makers in the group, but on top of that, you're also looking at what triggers them what content they're actually, that particular persona, is going to be most attracted to. And there's your, there's your, there's your engagement level. And then ultimately, the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you make them so comfortable that they'll advocate. And now you have a loyalty, that, 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 that top of the pyramid connection of, of warmth and comfort. You're, you're, you're having them as, as advocates, but also you're... You're going past the, the 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 what's you're doing into that that mission of why you're doing what you're doing. Boy, I just mixed a bunch of different things together there, but it's very it's, it's a linear thing that you're providing, but it is so intuitive yeah. because it, it it moves them along that 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 line of of attraction basically, right? And at least in your mind, right? Like I think I think people or customers don't necessarily follow a a, a step by step process like. Some people move faster through the process than others based mm -hmm. on what their needs are. But the reality is, if you know who your target audience is, and if you're focused on them, the, the, the end result is going to be that they are going to be having uh, time, spending more time with you. And that's what you want. I remember in our own company at Terminus, before we kind of flipped completely to do an account-based marketing approach, our sales rep will have 1,000 accounts in their name makes no sense, right? Because they are obviously going to be batch and blast and send, and this happens to almost all the organization out there, like sales rep have as many accounts they want. Now, our sales team has, every single sales rep has only 100 accounts at max. Like that's the max number of accounts you can possibly have, hmm. which means you have to be very diligent and careful about what type of outreach they do. So they, wow. are, they never just put them in a nurture program and blast it. They know that if they are, if any of them unsubscribes or any of them uh, are not the ones that they can go after, then they, they will have one less account or five less accounts. So <laughs> we are limiting them to figure out like, okay, marketing and sales, you need to work together as one team, which means we're not going to give a thousand accounts to every rep. Oh my gosh. I mean, uh, the salesperson in, in me pe is petrified by that because yeah. literally you have the ability to create stalkers of, <laughs> of the sales rep if you're not careful. But at yes. the same time, they got to be good at what they do. So no longer is this is this grinding through as many as possible to see what comes out on the other end with maybe a lackluster approach. You've got to hire 
very smart people, sharp people that understand relationships and understand the content that that their accounts would engage with. Yeah. It's, 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 it's great, but at the same time, um, there's it's there's hard. yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it certainly does um, generate results because we also know that. Um, you know, the 80-20 rule from from kind of expanding your services, it's so much easier to expand to different services for for an existing customer than it is to actually acquire a new customer. So you're kind of falling right into that lane as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, if we, we, so I'll, I'll give you another example. So Morgan here, at, who has been an SDR for a year, she just got promoted to an account executive. She has been, because we limited the accounts, marketing and sales, they have only one scorecard. Marketing doesn't have a lead goal. Say They have the same number, their, their bonus, everything is dependent on sales meetings. So sales and marketing, they just have one scorecard. They look at, we can go into the scorecard um, in a little bit mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah. But she, for example, she's like, okay, I got only 75 to 100 accounts. What do I do? She's great at videos. So what she figured out is that she's going to run one-to-one -one ads through Terminus platform, and then she's going to do videos for every single account that she wants to connect with. So she will research about them. She will do a very personalized video, and, and we'll use video art for that as a, as a, customer, as a platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, she will do a one-to-one -one video for three or four of the decision makers based on what their needs are, based on what, they, what the latest article they wrote, or something out there so that she will connect. Her open rate on emails are about 80 to 90 percent. Oh. So it, it really pushed people to do what they're good at. We're like, we're not measuring sales team and our marketing team based on how many emails they send because it's like, you know, how many can they send, right? Any number. But it's based on how many meaningful, as you said, conversations and relationships they're having. So it forced some of them, some are good on videos, so they do videos. Some of them are really good at like socially engaging, so they're doing connecting and just posting more stuff on LinkedIn. Hmm. Some of them are writing really good writers, so they essentially craft a really well-crafted email and, and they get more. But so it really depends on what your customer and you are good at, and it really focuses on the engagement aspect as opposed to batch and last. Wow, uh, I'm just I'm, I'm, you got my gears going on, and in so many different ways. What you're doing is you're you're, you're leveraging the native skill of of a rep, and you're giving them the ability because I mean they're they're marketing, but they're also they're going to utilize their particular proficiencies to a much greater degree than shoving them into a different type of marketing execution or or sales reach execution that one they may not even favor, but two they don't even know how to do it and they have no passion to even learn how to do it. So what you're doing is you're you're capitalizing on what the what the, the principal passions are of that particular individual and you're also getting them to align with customers that respond in the very same way. Yep. Oh, I it, dig it. That's awesome. Yeah, it changes the the energy levels. It changes the the level of um, authenticity in the whole process, right? Because you can't fake it when you're on a video. So the people who are going to be on a video are the ones that really love it. And, and they try a bunch of things and you don't need to tell them what to do. Hmm. They're gonna test a bunch of, and they're going to fail and, and, and that's okay. But that's the part of the game as opposed to saying do 80 emails and do 50 calls. That doesn't work anymore. No, it doesn't. And they're going to take much more personal responsibility in seeing that it doesn't fail. And they're also going to take more responsibility into finding out why something did fail if it's coming from them, right? Wow. All right. Well, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, get, getting back to the 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 uh, the uh, the, uh, the flip the funnel process, has there been any difficulty in implementing this type of process, either from your organization or somebody else's? It's hard. It is extremely hard hmm. because you, you you alluded to some of the things. You are fundamentally changing the way people are measuring success. Um, and we have, as organizations and, uh, and just marketing and sales people, we have used the crutch, as marketers have used the crutch of uh, leads. Like, as long as you get more leads, you're doing your job. So they've been just using that as a crutch for many years and still do. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I'm doing the calls, I'm doing the, the emails, and I'm still not seeing success. So that means there's something wrong with the product or whatnot. So sales have been using the, the crutches of number of calls and number of emails. So I think now we are getting into an era, if you want your job a year from now, mm -hmm. I get 
you won't have your job a year from now if you are on those crutches. It, it's just not going to work. Right. right. So where things are moving and where we saw a tremendous amount of pain is we had to completely restructure the sales compensation to support a much more uh, targeted approach. We had to change marketing metrics to say that, okay, we're not going to ask you how many people were on the website anymore. We're going to ask you, are the right type of people on the website? Hmm. Instead of asking how many leads we generated, we're going to ask you, did we create engagement? And what, uh, how are we going to measure engagement? How much time those right people are spending on time? Instead of prospecting every single thing, hmm. we're going to future customers so we would know what the TAM is. So that required a fundamental shift in mindset on the sales, marketing, but also as an executive team and all the way to the board because the board has always looked at everything in spreadsheets. And now they're saying, well, that big spreadsheet with thousand at the top and one at the bottom is not going to work anymore. We are flipping it. So it, it has been extremely hard, but I know ourselves and many organizations as our customers of Terminus and others, 600, 700 of them, we are seeing that it has changing the way marketing, marketing, marketing is taking more accountability on which accounts we need to go after and they're able to create more programs that work with sales and marketing, but it is hard and it takes time in the beginning. Later on, it works. Right. Because the amount of efforts that you're putting into that, um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of productive to try to even do that from a mass uh, mass direction, and, and, and you just can't do it. So yeah. tell us about the scorecard, because um, as you're talking about measuring success, uh, there's going to be a lot of companies, and I'm sure I know that you've experienced that, that is, it's, it's like oil, oil and water, that they, they, they can't understand that it's not about numbers anymore. It's, a, it's about that engagement factor. So tell us about that scorecard. How do you measure them? So it's great. It's something that has been work in progress for us for about four years. And we, we feel like we finally have it. And we call it the team scorecard. Um, so team stands for target, um, activate, uh, sorry, target, activate, uh, measure, and I forgot the one. T. Tar oh, sorry. Target, engage, activate, and measure. I forgot. Like, I wasn't going to check your spelling there, but I, I'm, I'm glad we're spot on. <laughs> So that, and that's why it took four years. Because I <laughs> uh, but so, so the target meaning we, we essentially made sure that not only we know the list of target accounts, yep. but we know what tier they fall in. So we created tiers saying tier one, tier two, tier three. And now those are the tiers that we're focused on. Tier one, meaning the accounts that we really care about. We know there's a higher likelihood for turning them into customers. There's a more contract value that we can generate for them. So there's a set of salespeople and marketing programs aligned to tier one. Tier two is kind of the medium layer. And tier three are the ones that are great fit, but may not have the highest value right now. So we're, we're not going to do as much work on them, um, but let them come through inbound uh, if, if mm -hmm. we get it. That tiering has allowed us to figure out where to focus which is really like 90% of like the effort um, from our perspective. Yep. And then it comes to um, activate. Now, you know, we, we so engage. Now we're trying to figure out like, okay, which of these accounts we want to start engaging? And engagement, again, as we talked through, could go through many different ways, right? Marketing can do more broad-based activities like, uh, like, you know, blogs and events. But instead of that, we're saying, well, we know who these people are. Why not we just start engaging them on their terms? So we're figuring out, okay, tier one, some of these people are in Boston. So why not do an event in Boston? Let's just do a dinner over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, some of them are in the same industry. Why not do a webinar just on that industry and get the right people in it? Not about 100 people, 10 people. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. because those 10 are the best fit. So engagement is really re re redefined engagement as being focusing on what it might matter for those tiers. Activate is now coming into the sales world. We, after all this engagement, anytime any of these people in these tiers are showing any level of activity on the website or the product page or the pricing page, then we activate the sales team to say, oh, sales team, all the work that we've been doing, now finally we're seeing people from these companies that you care about, that we agreed that are tier one, are actually engaging with us on our website. You're activated, which means they are not going to do their own out outbound calls and emails. So now the outbound calls and emails that sales team are doing are much more thoughtful. All right. Uh, I, I, got, I got a push. I got a hand up. Uh, uh, I got a question here. <laughs> um, the attribution, right? Yeah. How are we, how are you attributing that, that engagement to those targets? Oh, to, that's a great question. That's to, a great question. To so the, the web activity 
Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. So what we have done is we are not trying to measure any and everything. We do. We have thrown away first touch attribution. We have thrown away last touch attribution. We're like, we'll go crazy if you want to just measure everything. Right. So what matters to measure? So now that we know which accounts, so let's say account X. If anybody from account X is coming to your website and is on the product page and is on the pricing page, that is engagement to us. That's what triggers activation. Mm -hmm. Not any and everybody who comes to, if anybody from that tiered account. So it literally engagement is, and the triggering is based on if the right people from the right companies that we care about are on our website on the right pages. So you're doing, uh, again, we have to know the companies uh, that are coming through. We have to be able to, to be able to tag them before they've come to the site at all with a cookie, right? So you well, do. So we do anonymous tracking as well. So that allows us to figure out the reverse IP lookup to right. allow, oh, these are the companies that are on our website. But it, originally, like, you know, back in the days, we didn't want, we never paid attention to that. And when we did, we looked at everybody's qualified as if because somebody's on the website, they're qualified. Right. Not like, no, 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 not everybody's qualified. If they don't fit in this tier category, then we're going to have a stricter. Uh, qualification process because they're not mm -hmm. our best fit accounts. We're going to have churn issues later on if you don't fit, if mm -hmm. you don't get the right. So we're mm -hmm. looking at from business overall business perspective as opposed to just sales funnel. And, and that's really important because it's not only a sales process and a methodology and tying into particular outreach touches. You can't get. Uh, turned around by the amount of traffic coming into the site. You really have to orchestrate your site. Um, to that personal approach as well. Do you guys, do, do you pull off any type of pearls or personalized URLs to be able to have that level of, of uh, uh, authentic touch that you know nobody else is going to be hitting that page except for Company X? Yeah, so we so we are tracking that on our end. Where we know exactly which company. We also know what roles uh, they are in. If they have obviously filled up a form or something like that, then we'll know who that person is. But at a minimum, even if they have not done that, we would know the company and the role. Now, that's more than enough information for a sales rep to figure out, yep. oh, because they only have 75 to 100 accounts. So they don't have 1,000 accounts to go through. If it is one of their accounts, they already know something about that account and it's probably trying to jump into that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, Percy. I'm sorry. I, I wanted I wanted to talk about attribution there because that's really a key factor for this entire process uh, oh, process of success, right? Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the team, like like target, engage, activate, and measure. So you were right on the measure part of is like you know how do we measure? And that has been the hardest part of it because leads is so easy to measure, mm -hmm. engagement is so hard to measure, right? So it was hard. So it really started with figuring out and making sure that, look, as a marketing and sales as a unit, we cannot be measuring two different metrics. Just not going to work. So marketing and sales have to come together and say, we have the same metric. Our bonuses are focused on the same thing. Mm -hmm. So marketers, we don't, we, we don't ask the marketing team to generate leads. We just say, I'll create engagement in these tiered accounts. Otherwise, we are missing out. And the conversations, we call it this marketing meeting where sales and marketing meets every week, is really figuring out how much engagement do we have on tier one? Oh, we only have 10% engagement. Well, what's wrong? What can we do here? So now the conversations are, here's the many of things marketing can do, mm. but which one makes sense to do right now, as opposed to marketing going in a corner and coming up with their own plan. It's a combined effort. And that's where, I mean, we are seeing the convergence uh, yeah. of, of, uh, of marketing and sales. And, and they literally have been opposing corners sure. of the room for yeah. the longest time. Um, they have to work together. And if you're doing account-based management, uh, uh, account-based marketing, there that that is that's that's the combined effort. They can't separate because they have to have those tactics, those personalized tactics that's, that are going to come from the marketing side of things. Um, and and sales has to be able to give information to marketing to be able to get that input and create that type of content that's going to be more engaging for that target. I so love I, love, I love this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my it's gears good. are going, man. Yeah. Now I will, I'll tell you this. What's the funniest thing of all of it um, is that if you ask any salesperson what they're or, or, or know uh, of salespeople, their title is account executives. So salespeople have always been working in the account world. Mm -hmm. Problem has been that we as marketing people have given them leads. 
And they have been like looking at us like you're in a headlight. It's like, why do you keep giving me leads? I want the leads in my right accounts. So finally, instead of talking about stuff, we are actually working together. So uh, there's a lot of goodness in this for sure. Oddly enough, you get marketing and sales in the same room and all of a sudden uh, you have some some great goals, but they also, they're very opinionated, I got to say. Uh, sales and marketing, they, they, they both think they can do each other's jobs. <laughs> and, and better. And better. And better. <laughs> so uh, from this deployment for different companies, <laughs> you almost need to bring along a, a corporate counselor to be able to, to help them all appreciate <laughs> each other's differences, too. So uh, No doubt. We, uh, we, we call it the therapy session. Uh, <laughs> we all need that at any given. We actually have a corporate coach uh, in our company who comes in and meets with all the executives and uh, high potential leaders in the company every single week mm -hmm. uh, based on like different conferences. So every month he's here every week to meet different folks. So every month at least once, one of our executives and one of our leaders have met them. And those are like the therapy sessions. That's when uh, you can talk about, oh, I don't get this. Mm -hmm. and, what, and then he would just help them talk through it and all that stuff. I think it's really important. No, it absolutely is. So um, identifying the customers is one of the also most more challenging. You wouldn't think of it think it would be, but for companies embracing this, this particular execution, um, having, ha I guess what I'm, I guess the, 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 the role of the salesperson to be able to find those targets, there's always a risk for them truly knowing the target and they can certainly be educated by, by marketing, but, but, uh, you got to know where you're pointing you get, yeah. and you've got to define that to a much better degree than any other broad-based marketing. So do you have tools? Do you have disciplines to be able to help those clients you help uh, get there? So we, as a company, don't um, have like very specific tools for it. We partner with a ton. Mm -hmm. I look at it as a, as a model. If somebody's kind of thinking of like how to do it, because it's a great question. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle. It's like, well, how do I do it? How do I start it? Um, so I look at it in a, and we've been talking about this uh, internally around a fit, intent, and engagement model. So the fit is really where you can use LinkedIn and Bombora and a lot of a lot of different data providers to figure out what does my fit look like. If you, here are the ten customers we have, we are really awesome. Give me, tell me who, tell me the list of companies that are like these, right? Mm -hmm. So that that gives you the fit. Right. Then, Ten is where a you know a, a really good company is Bombara that we very closely partner with is will show that when any of the companies that you have tiered and put in the fit criteria goes online and looks for stuff that is similar to your company any products or services similar to your company then it will show you give you a trigger and say that hey this company is ready uh, because there are people in this company looking for a solution in mm -hmm. your industry that gives you an intent. And then you get into the engagement platform where, where again, come like softwares like Terminus and others are able to help you now do one-on-one -on -one campaigns with them that allows you to now engage with them at the right time mm -hmm. when they're actually interested. So this, this idea of fit, intent, and engagement really forces us to think about start with the right companies, figure out where they're ready to buy, and then really engage with them at that time. And you can only do that when you're not going in volumes, but you're actually doing it at a much personalized level. Which, I got another question there, because from a marketing standpoint, you want to have you want to have a feedback loop to see whether or not you're doing it right. Okay, and that, that comes with a lot of data points, a, a, a good data sample, right? Now we're narrowing that data sample. It's wow. much more subjective who we're talking to. So is it difficult to infer, infer from that if we're doing it right, if the target is so narrow that um, it could be a number of reasons why they're not engaging on that particular marketing tactic. Oh, totally. I, I feel like the greatest, I'm so glad you asked that. I think the best place to start this is not in demand generation. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that might surprise uh, some people. Uh, is the best place to do accomplished marketing is in pipeline velocity or customer marketing campaigns. So, because when you when somebody is in a pipeline, which means the salesperson uh, and the, the future customer who you're trying to reach out to has already said, hey, we're ready to buy. We're going to buy from you or mm -hmm. we're going to buy from one of your competitors. At that point, when you start doing account-based marketing, you're running targeted ads, you're running direct mail, you're doing a very 
uh, synchronized campaigns with your sales and marketing working together as one team. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with customer marketing, right? When you are upselling, or I, I, we think about it as upserving, when you're upserving your customers with a new product or a new service, then you already know enough about them and you can see the win rate on it. So the ideal place to start to test this hypothesis is in platinum velocity and customer marketing. And then you take the learnings from that and start applying to certain segments based mm. on verticals or personas on the demand gen. And I think that's where it is a wild card. You don't know when somebody's going to buy on a demand gen side, but on a platinum velocity, you know that they have raised their hand and they're going to buy from you or your competitor. No, that's smart. That's smart because they're sending signals that are already attuned to, to uh, uh, what they're what they wanted to begin with. So, I mean, you got to still have to set up the the factors of of testing different types of messaging, right? right? Um, and you have to have still the the marketing hypothesis and the marketing science behind it. And but but you you align it more you, it's say it's a safer harbor to experiment as opposed to trying to to uh, try it out and not be able to get the data samples cuz you can go wildly out of out of control by inferring something from such a small group of of targets right okay so that that, that, that makes sense excellent the last step uh, in the in this in, in the space uh, in this process you were talking about was advocate okay yeah you say the most marketing teams have zero budget for to spend on existing customers. Now, we just talked about this, is that your highest amount of revenue comes from the existing customers. And what you're, what you're saying is that little or no time is spent to, to leverage and be able to connect to them. Why is that the case? Uh, it is a, uh, you know, as, as I started Terminus, I realized that as a founding member, as we started to raise money, I think the investors and everybody out there in the marketplace always looks at the top line revenue number. And nobody is looking at the overall, like what, what's happening between the net. And the best companies that are growing are not necessarily growing because their top line revenue is up. Mm -hmm. They're growing because they have a net negative churn, which means that they are not losing money. A lot of companies that I see right now have... A lot coming in the front, and then at the same speed, they're going out, but they are turning off. And that pushes everybody to, oh, get more customers. As a matter of what you should be really doing is go back and fix what's happening at the back end. Either you're not getting the right, so you didn't have the fit and intent criteria correctly identified, or you're over-promising and under-delivering, so you got to fix that. Maybe you need to have more customer success people on the team to support your service or product. Or you, you just had a misunderstood value proposition that's just not working, so you need to fix that. Hmm. What I see happening more often than not is it is so much more easier to hit the gong every single Monday when you close X number of deals and feel like that's the success metric, whereas your customers who are the lifeblood of what a company's growth valuation is going to be all about, it just becomes the after the poster child later on, kind of like, yeah, we will look into that. Hmm. And I feel it's a big mistake. It is. Um, it, I think it has to do with the maturity of, of just the sales pipeline mindset is that it's a lot easier to start a new conversation than trying to fix what you broke or that recognize that you hadn't had enough knowledge about what you were running to be able to even systematize and test test this stuff. So it's a lot easier just to go off and, and get new numbers. I mean, that's yeah. the discipline. Go ahead. Absolutely. I would, I would further to your point uh, is saying that, hey, you know what? The compensation is wrong. We comp salespeople way higher than we comp uh, customer success people. Customer success are actually the lowest paying jobs in companies as wow. opposed to sales. So I think the compensation model is actually wrong. And wherever the money goes, that's where the, the conversations are going to go. So because the money is spent over here more, hmm. people are spending more time here. As soon as you move the money and say, you know what? We need to retain more customers, so we're going to change the compensation. It's not about just top end revenue; it's about quality growth as a business. It's going to change, uh, but that uh, comp customer success team is not the one that gets the most paid, or there's a compensation to keep customers. Wow. They just keep jobs if they keep customers. That's also also in the kind of the same line as your technical support is your yeah. customer service, yep. and you're dealing with people that don't get compensated that much, and they, they don't demonstrate the passion or the care for the company. You've got to put the money way and to motivate people to be able to internally advocate 
yeah. as opposed to externally advocate. Wow. My thoughts. Oh, you better believe it. Uh, so anyway, we can reverse that tr that trend. I mean, you're obviously kind of you're 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 standing in the middle of a current. <laughs> Everything's going the opposite direction. How do you how do you shift the uh, the current here and and get people get companies to understand the the inverted funnel the 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 relationship the account based marketing? Man, we uh, I mean I try to get on as many of these kind of podcast conversations to talk about it and, and, and preach the gospel of uh, of a better way to do things. Yep. Uh, I think uh, I think it's it, it's it will require a very significant change. We've already seen that the Martech world, if you just look at that, has ballooned from 300, 400 marketing technologies to now 7,000 plus technologies <laughs> selling the same exact persona uh, and trying to get, and that's just unsustainable. Nobody can keep it. Um, there's a study that came out that shows that on an average, there are about 25 to 30 different tools that a, a small marketing team runs on a regular basis, as opposed to what it was two or three tools five years ago. Right. So a lot has shifted. People are in the product, in trying to figure things out, and are not taking the step back to figure out the strategy. So my biggest uh, challenge, and I guess the ask for any and everybody I talk to is that, let's just take a step back and look at the strategy. What is the purpose? What is the end? Let's have the end in mind very clear, and then go from there. Uh, and and it's, it's going to take time. Yeah, no, absolutely. But it's a discipline that's going to pay off, and it's already, I mean, uh, it's already kind of uh, showing itself in the marketplace um, from, I mean, you kind of see these signals coming from the digital marketing space where you hear about buyer's journey, you're hearing about these different engagement focuses that, that help at least marketing hone in to a much better degree, and sales is certainly appreciating that, and they're getting right into that space as well. Um, it's a lot easier to hold on to a customer and retain them uh, and be able to expand sales than it is to, to try to get new, and that's a, that's a big waste of money if you think about it because you don't have those relationships nearly as much as trying to go after the ones that fit, make sense, and, and you can give them something more than any uh, top-of-the-funnel engagement uh, expense would be able to provide you, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Excellent. It is it's a game-changer. Well, uh, we certainly, I, 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 you can tell I'm a bit excited about this. I'd love to be able to expand more on this um, because it is, it's the convergence of, of marketing and sales, which really ha didn't, shouldn't have ever been se separated to begin with. They're, they're, they're two hands of the same body and, and they have to be able to work together. Uh, you, know, you certainly want to have some coaches out there to be able to help departments communicate to each other a little bit better. But uh, uh, Sangram, it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, concept you have, and, and a really, we really wish you all the best with Terminus. Um, we usually finish up our, our, our shows here uh, just asking our guests, what really bugs you in, in your ver particular industry right now? Um, several things, but I'll try to keep it to one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think what bugs me is we, we, we don't define success very clearly. We, we define success in tactics as opposed to the overall end result. And, and I think I would love for everybody to, to take the time to really define what a picture of success look like when things are done, mm -hmm. uh, when we achieve something. Like, what does it look like? Does it mean just achieving certain things, or is it really getting to a bigger cause, wherever that needs to be? And I think the conversations that will happen as a result of it, when we together paint a clear picture of success, that we will be able to trace it back and say, well, here are the right things to do together. That's absolutely abundantly clear, and uh, it's, it's, it's truly a, uh, a, 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 um, an area where it covers m m more departments than just marketing. It's across the board, defining success. So conversely, what uh, we're going to flip the funnel on you here. What excites you <laughs> about your industry right now? See what I did there? I did. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I think this is the greatest time to be in marketing and sales. Uh, oh. We're able to more connect with people at a much easy level. The fact that we're able to do this podcast uh, and, and, and not be in the same room, but feel like we're in the same room. And so there's more technology that can enable greater conversations, faster communication. So we are surrounded by amazing amount of technology that, hmm. that can be used for the good. 
Uh, the question is, are we going to get it? So, so I feel I'm excited about everything that's happening right now because we're at the center of it. Yep. Um, if you're a marketer, if you're a salesperson, like, you know, the world uh, is, is ready for you. Like, just go for it. Well said. Well said. Well, um, for our listening and watching audience, um, any final thoughts about the uh, the inverted funnel of sales and and the marriage of sales, the, sometimes the four shotgun marriage of sales and marketing? Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, be ready and be okay to challenge the status quo, whatever that might mean in your organization, in your life right now, because that's when great things happen. There you are. Uh, so we certainly implore our audience to uh, go uh, track down Sa Sangram over at his Twitter handle, uh, Sangram Vajre, V-A-J-R-E, uh, on Facebook, J uh, S V A G R A E. my gosh, and LinkedIn, Sangram Vajre as well. Um, can we promote anything for you at the end of the show here? I know. I think the only thing I'll say, if anybody's interested in the book, uh, Account Based Marketing, just... Twitter mentioned me at, at Sangram Wajere, and I'll ship, a, ship you the book. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to tweet right now. I'm very interested in that. <laughs> right, very. I, I'll, I'll tweet you. I, I promise. I'll tweet you right <laughs> after the show. Not without a tweet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a cover charge. All right. Well, Sangram, it's been a joy talking to you, and we wish you all the best of luck in, in, in your pursuits and uh, Terminus as well, as well as the concept of Flip Your Funnel, because it's, it's very, very valuable, and it's a smart play, and more and more companies need to be able to, to focus on that. And pay your, pay your consumer active advocates a little bit more, everybody, right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Right. I really appreciate it. This has Not been fun. Problem. Absolutely. Well, thanks for listening to Edge of the Web Radio. And a special thank you to our uh, production, production staff over here at Site Strategics, as, uh, especially our guest, Sangram Vajre. Uh, make sure to check out all of the must see videos over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. And uh, we'll be talking to you next week. Who are we talking to next week? We've got Jay Bear. Yes, we do. So we're going to be uh, bringing Jay Bear back, and we're going to be talking about his new book. His right? new book, Talk Trigger. It's about uh, word of mouth marketing. Absolutely. So, hey, this is where it's at. So come back uh, next time, be able to jump into the live stream and uh, give us some questions to, to ask Jay. We'll certainly uh, facilitate that. So for all of us over here at Site Strategics and Edge of the Web, thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye. <laughs>